will rise up and spend some time in prayer. You commit yourself to the Lord in prayer tonight. That the Bible study will enrich your life. That what you hear will be made practical in your life. It will not just be reading the word, but the word will be able to reach the word through your life. Open your mouth and pray. And say to the Lord, help me Lord to pay attention. And to hear, to understand, to apply the word to my very life. Personal life. Family life, every part of your life, to be touched and reached by the world. That your attitude to the words of Jesus will put to the people around you that you love the Lord Jesus. And that your prayer life is being changed. By this teaching of prayer, by the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That the Lord will be able to see through your heart, through your life, that you love Him, you respect Him, you honor Him. You are attentive to His words, you are obedient to His words. And his word is having authority and power, dominion, lordship over your very life. That the world will not leave you the way it found you. You learn the word and you live by the word. And the word of God changing you from glory to glory from one level of achievement accomplishment to another level of accomplishment that your spiritual life is becoming better day by day as a result of this wonderful exposure to the word of God Increasing in the love of God, increasing in your submission to the word of God, increasing in your obedience of this unchanging word of God, until the word will literally transport you, translate you. To heaven, the great beyond, moving on, until this glory shines in your life, and there you are translated to the glory above. Pray that the word will not be in vain in your life. I do not receive the instruction in vain. You will not receive the grace of God in vain. You will not receive this great privilege, opportunity in vain. That every part of your life, your attitude, your behavior, your action, will be touched, transformed, changed by the entrance of the word of God, that this seed of the word sown in your heart will bear fruit thirty fold, sixty fold, a hundred fold.
In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you very much for once again we come together to have fellowship with you and to learn from our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray this privilege we have Monday after Monday, week after week, Lord, we pray to enrich our spiritual lives in Jesus' name. We ask you, Lord, that you will so impart yourself, your righteousness, your love, your attributes into every one of us study your word that people will see the glory of the Lord in our lives in Jesus' name. That will not be just readers of the word only, hearers of the word only, speakers and preachers of the word only, but Lord, this word will turn us around. We will obey this word and every little detail and every big event in our lives will be influenced by your word in Jesus' name. As we study tonight, open our eyes to see, our hearts to understand, and let there be a decision from the death of our heart that what you teach us will carry out and be obedient all through the days of our lives. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can see now. We come now to Matthew chapter 6. We are being a study. And there's no hurry. We are looking at the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer that he taught his own disciples. Well, we so much love the Lord. And we love the words of the Lord. I want to get everything he has for us in the teaching and instruction of his word concerning prayer. Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. We're looking at you from verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And then verses 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. These are the words in the prayer. And these are the prayer that the Lord taught His own disciples. And as we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, disciples are learners. Disciples are followers. Disciples are those who look at the Lord as master, as model, as mentor. And then they follow after that model, after that master, and after that model. And because we are disciples following after him, as he teaches and instructs us, we then look at this prayer. If we are true disciples, his teaching will change us. We'll say, I've been doing it this way before. Now I listen to the words of the master. And because the word of the master is having some impact and influence upon me, I will no more do it like that before. I used to go this direction before. But the watch of the master has not come unto me. And because his watch has reached me, I will no more go that direction. I want to go the direction that the master is leading. That's what the teaching of Jesus ought to do in our lives. And that's what the Bible study ought to do, ought to accomplish in our lives. Already we have started the teaching of the prayer. And we have seen in this prayer that the focus is God. And then Jesus Christ appeals the fatherhood of God. And then he tells us how to pray. The first part of the prayer concerns God and his glory. 
And the second part of the prayer concerns man and his need. We go through that part of God and now we go through the part of man. In the part of man in the prayer, we have three requests. Number one, give us this day. I believe is the need for the body. And then number two, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's the need of the soul. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the need of our spirit. The body, the soul, and the spirit. It's a total prayer concerning the total man. It's a complete prayer concerning the complete man. And not only that, it talks about our present need. Give us this day our daily bread. And then it talks about our past deeds. That is, forgive us our debts. That's what we did in the past. We offended God in the past. We sinned in the past. And because of that, we are coming to the Lord. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive those who sin against us. And then it talks about the future. Lead us not into temptation. That's talking about the future. But deliver us from evil. We knew that the first part, which is give us this day our daily bread. Now we're looking at that second part of the prayer, which is forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors who trespass against us. Now let's talk about what we've done in the past. And I need to tell you that God requires the past. There are many people that will say, whatever they did in the past actually doesn't matter. Whatever they said in the past actually doesn't matter. The behavior of the past, the action of the past, the deeds of the past, they tell us those things don't matter. They say they don't even want to bother themselves about what is gone. What is gone is gone. What they have done, they have done. What they have said, they have said. And whatever offense, whatever sin they committed in the past, they said that's gone. They said yesterday is gone. They don't even want to think about it. It will confront you in eternity. Because God requires the past. You must do something about it. And the sins of the past, the guilt of the past, the condemnation of the past will be following you like your shadow. You may not see the shadow depending on the direction you turn. But it's following you every time. That's why you need to do something about it. That's why Jesus said you must settle that account of the past. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 15. It's talking to us about the things that you thought is gone, is the past. That which has been is now. And that which is to be has already been. And God requires that which is past. And God requires that which is past. Did you see in the past? Have we done something about that? Did you steal in the past? Have you done something about that? Did you commit immorality in the past? Have you done something about that? Did you offend God in the past? Have you done something about that? Did you defraud anybody in the past? Have you done something about that? God requires that which is past. That's the reason Jesus came. Not only that he taught us, he died for us. And you see, he died for us so that the sins of the past can be forgiven. Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verse 24, 20, uh, verse 25. Be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Who God has set for us to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the over remission, pardon, forgiveness of sins that are.
past to declare his righteousness and for the removal or remission of cleansing or forgiveness of sins that are past. That's what you be about it. The sins of the past, the offense of the past. We need to settle that as we come to the Lord and then we pray and we say because of Christ, for the sake of Christ, because of his cross, because of his death, in trusting the blood that is shed for us, we come now that the sins of the past will be forgiven through the forbearance of God. It's so very important then, that's why Jesus taught his disciples, and that's why Jesus is teaching us, settle the account of the past. Forgiveness or pardon for sin is the most essential, the most blessed, and the most difficult act that God ever did for man. Those three things. Number one is the most essential. Number two is the most blessed. Number three is the most costly, the most difficult of all that God ever did for man. Why do we say that? Number one is essential because it gives us, it, it relieves us and keeps us from eternal suffering in hell. Why it not for the forgiveness of the Lord? Why it not because it's a pardoning God? We'll not be able to escape the horrors and the terrors and the suffering and the pain of hell. But because of the forgiveness. That's why we can then come to the Lord. I want to escape hell. I want to escape the final judgment. I want to escape all the all the terror that is coming upon this world at the end of time because of that you come and you pray forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors that's what will give us joy in our present life with fellowship with him number two is the most blessed is forgiveness is pardon this prayer that we're learning about today Forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses, our sins, as we forgive those that trespass against us. It's the most blessed because it secures us a place in heaven. A place in heaven. The guilty sinner does not resolve that guilt. That guilt before he dies will not be able to have a place in heaven. But this blessed gift, the forgiveness of the Lord, the Lord presents unto every one of us and he says, I can forgive you because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and as you stretch forth your hand of faith and receive that forgiveness then you're paving the way for yourselves so the blood of the Lamb, a place in heaven. Number three is the most costly. It's the most difficult. Because you see, God cannot just forgive like that. He himself had laid down the principle and the law and the world. The soul that sinners it shall die. And he told that to Adam and Eve. In, on the day you eat of that tree, you will die. And you know, if God said something and he says, this is what will happen. And then if you did that thing and God said, all right, don't do that again, but I swallow my word, I retract my word, I retrace my steps, and I will no more do what I said I will do, he will not be God. There will be part of him that will not be real. But you see, God is a just God, a righteous God, and his superior eyes are to behold iniquity, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And therefore man ought to die because of sin. All have sin and come short of the glory of God. How will man ever escape the death penalty that somebody else will take his place? Somebody else will be a substitute. And so Jesus came and he died for us. That's the only way. That will have God that forgiveness, that will have escape that death penalty. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That forgiveness is very costly because it has cost God the death of his only begotten son, giving his life on the cross of Calvary. Forgiveness of sin is man's deepest need. You've seen that already. And it's God's greatest gift. The Lord has promised that if the sinner confesses and forsakes his sins, and if by faith in the vicarious death of Christ, he trusts in God for forgiveness, he will be forgiven. I will be granted the privilege of sonship. It's important then that you pray the prayer that millions of others have prayed, and peace has come into their hearts. And the joy of belonging to the Lord has come into the earth. What kind of prayers? Let's look at it in uh, Psalm 25, verse 11. Psalm 25, verse 11. For thy name's sake, not because of my marriage, not because of your marriage, not because of your goodness. There's no goodness in you naturally. Not because of your good words. All our supposed good works, righteousnesses, and I feel the words. We do not merit anything before the Lord except judgment. But for thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. And so let those who come to God, knowing that their debts are great, so great, they cannot pay for themselves, relying only on the mercy of God and the merit of Christ. Those are the only people that will receive forgiveness. And you see when we receive forgiveness, what does it mean? Number one, it means freedom from condemnation. There's no condemnation now to those who walk in the spirit. We are not walking after the flesh. You are forgiven. Then there is no more condemnation. And there is no fear of judgment anymore. Number two, there is peace with God. Reconciliation with God. You are no more opposed to God. You are no more at enmity with God. Now you are peace with God. Reconciliation with God. Number three, you escape the wrath to come. That's why you need forgiveness. That's why you are asking the Lord. And that's why you want to pray sincerely. That's why you want to see, you want the Lord to see that sincerity in you. That this forgiveness is important and essential to you. It makes you to escape from the wrath to come. Number four, it brings fellowship with God in eternity. Fellowship with God in eternity. That's why we come to look at this today. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the plea and the prayer for forgiveness from God. The plea and the prayer for forgiveness from God. Number two, the promise and the privilege of forgiveness from God. The promise and the privilege. Of forgiveness from God. Number three, the possibility of forfeiting forgiveness from God and the peril of forfeiting forgiveness from God. The possibility is there to forfeit it, to lose it, to miss it. And the peril for those who miss it. The peril for those who lose it. And then they die without assurance that God has forgiven them. They have a lot of questions to answer because God is a, in controversy with them because of the unresolved problems of sin in their lives. Yes, the possibility is there and the peril will be very great. Come back to number one, the plea and the prayer for forgiveness from God. In Matthew chapter 6, we look at this verse 12. Here it says, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. It's telling us that sin is like debt. It gets you into debt. The Almighty God has created us. 
and we owe a very lie to him a very existence we owe to him and then we owe him obedience and submission and so he gives us his law and he says because i created you you would not have been if i didn't form you if i didn't create you you will not have lived if i didn't give you life and therefore you are responsible to him and because you are responsible to him he says this is all you pay to show that you appreciate my creating you my giving you the chance to live my giving the opportunity to enjoy life here is what you do only one thing obedience to my word obedience to my law and every time you refuse to pay that obedience then you are a debtor you refuse to pay that to be as that's all it requires this is my law this is my commandment now pay it every day that's your rent pay it every day you occupy space here pay your rent i give you life pay your rent i give you existence pay your rent what's the rent you are paying just obedience just obedience and when you refuse to pay that obedience and then you go into disobedience and you offend God and you sin now you have debts hanging on you what do you see how great is that debt since you were born you have been sinning a sinner by nature a sinner by practice a sinner by habit a deliberate sinner you know what the lord requires and he says this is it show that you are grateful i created you show that you are grateful i gave you life and then you say no i'm not going to show any gratitude and i will not pay obedience the price of obedience then you are a debtor now if you want to reconcile with god then the Lord will say, you come back to the Lord, you say, Lord, can I pay what I owe? Impossible for me. The debt is so great. The guilt is so great. The condemnation is so great. The Lord is so great. It's weighing me down. The only thing I'm asking for is mercy. Forgive me, Lord. That's what the Lord is teaching us. That the debt is so great you cannot pay for yourself. The debt of, uh, that you caused by disobedience all through your life. And he says, now you come to pray. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. Actually, what he called, what the Lord calls debt the sin. Look at the parallel passage in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 4. Why don't you read from verse 2? And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, A Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive our sins. You see, it's the same prayer, basically. And what he called debts in Matthew is calling it sin in Luke. And forgive us our sins in the plural. Sins in the plural. Then he said, For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Do you see the second part? Indebted. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us, instead of saying those who sin against us, he said, those who are indebted unto us. The same prayer. So the sins actually means the debt. But the debt also means the sins. What is sin, by the way? When we say somebody has sin, what is sin? In the original language, it means number one, missing the mark of God's required standard. God lays the standard. And he says, this is how to live. I made you. He manufactured us. He made us. He created us. And then he gave us the manual. 
of how that human machinery will work and work well without any friction. And that's the Bible. And it says, follow that manual. And we just, uh, you know, turn everything upside down. And we have not been following the manual. We have been missing the mark. That God has said, the standard that he said, number two sin is the transgression. 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 That means you step across the line. Or you transgress. That means you step across the line. Stepping across the line, drawn by God to demarcate what is right from what is wrong. How many times have you done that? In your personal life, transgressing, going beyond, going across the line of right and wrong. And then number three, sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You think about that the law is there, but you disregard the law. And you overlook the law. And you step on the law. And you abandon that law. And we become lawless. As if there were no law, no rule of action. And we just do whatever we want to. That is sin. Sin is lawlessness, the breaking of God's law. And the Bible says God will judge all lawlessness. Number four, sin is sleeping, sliding, falling, losing control, and falling into the degrading lifestyle. Those are the deaths. And then it says, number five, sin is dead. And it says God graciously writes up the debts of sin that we owe. No man can hope to pay up his debts of sin from birth. That's the reason we're praying to God. I pray God will forgive you. Give me a good amen. amen. Psalm 25 verse 11. Psalm 25 reading from verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, Pardon mine iniquity. If you look at the head of the psalm, that is the title in Psalm 25. This is some of David. He was a great man. He was a great warrior. He was a great conqueror. He was a great king. Yet he knew that the title will not give him a place in heaven. If the seas were there. That the position will not give him a place in the presence of God in eternity. If the sins remain there, we notice that my brother, my sister, it's wonderful to have great position in this world. And it's wonderful to have great position not only in the world, even in the church. What a great position to be a pastor and to be a worker, to be a leader in the church of the living God. But that position, as wonderful as the position may be, will not give us a place in heaven if the cord, if the load of guilt is hanging on our neck. And we'll be living in sin, committing sin, owing debts we have not paid. And when you get to the border, to the gates of heaven, you cannot say, here I come. I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I was a leader in the church. I was this. I was that. If there is sin in your life, it will drag you down to hell. That's the reason why, whether you are a king or a queen or a prince, whether you are a leader, a preacher or a pastor, whether you are just a member of the church or very person of the church, you come before the Lord like David came and you say, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Can you think about that? For it is great. There is no little sin in the sight of God. When you disobey a great God, that's a great disobedience. In the great King of Heaven, in the great God of Heaven, lays a rule down and it says, Don't overstep that boundary. If you overstep it, because you disobey a great God, what you have done is a great sin. 
So don't ever say, after all, my sins are small. No, they are sins against the Almighty. They are sins against the great God of heaven. That's why David said, Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. I need to come with that attitude. You know, it's not just the words to say. Anybody can say this, Pardon my iniquity, because it is great. Pharaoh said that, but he wasn't sober. Pharaoh said that, but he wasn't sincere. Pharaoh said that, but he wasn't repentant. Pharaoh said that it was all hypocrisy. Pharaoh said that it was all superficial. And of course, you know, Pharaoh never got, he, he never got a, a salvation, he never got forgiveness. You have to say to a sincere heart, a burning heart. You really know you have offended the Almighty God. And you know, there's no small sin in the sight of the Lord. And therefore, you come with a plea, with a prayer, with a request. Pardon my iniquity because it is great. Let me show you one man that came in Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven. He was sorrowful because of his sin. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. And he were told, but he smote his breast. Saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Anybody can repeat that. There are many religious people that repeat something like this every Sunday. But they are not sincere. They are serious about it. They are sober about it. They don't mean it. They just come. We have done what we shouldn't have done. We have not done what we should have done. Forgive us. It's not real. It's like a coward just reciting something. But this man came with a broken heart, a humble spirit, a contrite spirit, feeling very sorry because of what he had done. He felt so guilty and so ashamed of his spiritual state in the sight of the Almighty God. And they were told, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, forgiven, because he came with a broken heart. Look at David again in some future one. In some future one, we're looking at, or we're looking at some future one, verse one. Have mercy upon me, O God. Again, I want to remind you. But this prayer, when David prayed it, he prayed from the depth of his heart. You know, he was a king even at that time. And a captain of an army at that time, normally. The king or the president of any country is the commander in chief of that of the army of that country. And David was the commander in chief. And he had seen the wife of liars. And he just felt, I'll take his wife while he's away. And then he went into sin with that woman. The woman became pregnant. David wanted to cover it up. That's what people do. Cover it up. Cover it up. But no matter what you do to cover it up, it's never covered up. Because the Lord can see through your plastic bag. That you are covering ways. And then he sent for Rias from the battlefield. Rias came, how is the battle going? It's going well. I have to rush back now. Don't go back. Go back home and refresh yourself with your wife. He wanted the man to meet with his wife so that the pregnancy would look like you are responsible and didn't touch your wife. But the man was so committed, committed to the nation, and committed to the king, he will not go home. Why didn't you go home? You come from the battlefield, and you try to put pressure on him to go home. Oh, the man said, the ark of the Lord is on the battlefield, and Joab, my master, my captain, is on the battlefield. How can I go home to my wife and refresh myself? And let me just, before I go on with that story, can you see how committed Orias was to the king and then to Joab? 
and that such a king could touch the wife of a committed servant. Isn't it a terrible scene in the leader of a church, the overseer in a church, the pastor in a church, the leader in a church, having all these workers and they're committed to God and they're committed to you. And then secretly you touch their wives, you touch the wives of committed members and leaders in the church. What a great, terrible scene. You might cover it all, but God sees through everything. That's what David did. Eventually, when the man will not go home, then he sent a letter. How wicked to write a letter of death and give it to the man. And the man was so sincere, the man was so submissive, he did not open the letter. How can you be that wicked to somebody who is so submissive to you? Who loves you so much and will carry that letter without opening it? Give it to Joab. Joab read it. And it sent, he sent him to the hardest part of the battle. And the man will not say no. If you kill a man like that, that gives all his life, everything is God obeying you and serving you and carrying out your commandment, obviously, that's a great sin. And what have you done? Well, you analyze what you have done against your friend, against the wife of your friend, against the daughter of your friend. My daughter will stay with you while I travel out. Take care of her like your daughter. When he might trust you like that, and then before he comes back, you've done evil to the person that trusted you so much. That's why David eventually realized it was a good sin. That's why he came to pray. And the prayer was not totally secret. It's written down. It's written down. He said, if there's any shame, I'll bear the shame. That's, that's real repentance. That's why he said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Can you say I use a personal pronoun, me, my, I, in all these places against me and the only have I sinned? And done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I, as a king, he forgot his position. You see, when you come before the Lord, and you say, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us, you forget your position, you forget your title, you forget your dignity, you forget your, 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 your privilege in life, or your profession. And this man totally forgot, he said, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, that desirous truth in the inward parts. You don't want truth superficially on my lips. You want truth in the inward parts. You deserve purity through and through. In my heart, in my mind, in my thoughts, in my imagination. You deserve truth. You know, there are some people that uh, they will tell truth superficially in the public, but deep, deep, deep in the secret, they cover up quite a lot. And David knew that. David knew that. That's why I said, I know what you desire. You don't want superficial truth, superficial honesty, superficial righteousness, superficial holiness. Holiness in the public. But satanic attitude in the, in the private, God doesn't want that. Behold, that desires truth in the inward past, and in the hidden past, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. But seven, Lord, touch me with his soul, 
and I shall be clean. He said, I pressed it, he wasn't clean. He wanted a washing, a cleansing, a purging, a purifying. Touch me with his soul, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be white on snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. You see, it's not even the adultery alone. You know, subtle adultery, then murder, then make, you know, making the man drunk and then writing that bad letter and sending that man to his, you know, death is uh, on the stake and then killing the man with the sword of the, of those enemies. And he said, my bones are broken, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Is creating me clean heart will God renew a right spirit within me. That's a prayer you ought to pray with all your heart. And then you say, in verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence, and, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Look at verse 13. Then, only then. Then, after the forgiveness, then, after the restoration into the joy of salvation, then will I teach transgressors thy way. You understand the meaning of that? I'm disqualified from preaching. If sin is there, and the sin has not been confessed, and the sin has not been forgiven, I'm disqualified from teaching other people. Nobody may stop you, you have to stop yourself. And you have to realize, whatever you preach while you are in sin, while you are under guilt and condemnation, is worthless. Doesn't help you, doesn't help anybody, and Satan will just be laughing at you. And Satan will just be saying, look at this self-deluded man pointing other people to heaven while he's going to hell. Look at this self-deceived man trying to tell other people how to live straight while his life is crooked. Satan will be making fun of you. He's trying to open a holy Bible and teach the holy Bible and talk about the holy God while his life is ungodly and unholy. Satan will be making jest of you. He'll be pointing to all the other demons. See this man, this church man. See the self-deceiver. Trying to tell other people how to get to heaven. Why is a slave of sin, a slave of Satan? That's why David said, Oh Lord, I cannot teach anybody now. I need the teaching myself. He said, I cannot preach now. I need the preaching myself. He said, Purge me, cleanse me, wash me, grant me, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Only then will I teach transgressors thy ways. And then he said, And sinners will be turned unto thee. What did he say that? I will teach them only when I'm forgiven, and then sinners will be turned unto thee. Preacher. The world is watching you. Don't you know? David did not go to Bathsheba. He sent some people. Those people knew what David did. And then when David covered up how Uriah died, Joab knew. And when that man carried the letter, all the people knew the sins of leaders is open. Before the whole world, the devil is watching you. The demons are watching you. Your neighbors are watching you. They know. And if you try to preach, nobody will talk. Nobody will repent. Nobody, nobody will do anything. They will just be gossiping and saying, see your friend. See so and so. He's trying to preach. And we know all his secret. Nobody will use him. But he said, forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me, purge me, restore to me the joy of the salvation. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners will be turned unto thee. I pray God will give us a good heart, a sincere heart, a sober heart that will actually come before the Lord and do what is right. Now, 
when God gives us the forgiveness, two other things will follow. Forgiveness, number one. Fellowship, number two. Freedom, number three. It's not just that we are forgiven and then you are giving license to go and keep on sinning. There's no forgiveness. When God forgives us, number one, He forgives, number two, He brings us into fellowship with Him, number three, He gives us freedom, freedom from sin. Psalm 130. Psalm 130, I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 130, verse 4. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. When God forgives us, it's not a license to keep on sinning. I will fear him. That fear, what will be the result of such a fear? Psalm 4, I'm reading from verse 4. But, it says, stand in awe and sin not. Stand in fear, in honor, in reverence, the reverence of God. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep it his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. And they also do no iniquity. When you are forgiven, you are not continuing sin. When the reality of forgiveness is there, they do no iniquity. They walk in his way. Psalm 39 verse 1. It's Tonight, this one, here is what it says forgiveness, fellowship, and freedom. In Psalm 39, verse 1, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongues. I will take heed unto my ways. Have you been forgiven? Now you are careful. Have you been forgiven? Now you are sober. Have you been forgiven? Now you are deliberate and now you avoid falling into temptation. And then we read from John chapter 8 verse 11. John 8 verse 11. This is the consequence of forgiveness. You come into fellowship with the Lord and then you have freedom. Freedom from sin after the forgiveness has been given to you. In John chapter 8 verse 11, and she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's the result of the forgiveness. Neither do I condemn you, I forgive you. All your past I forgive. Have you repented as forgiveness? Are you sober and sorrowful? There's, there is forgiveness, but after that forgiveness, you come into fellowship with the Lord and freedom from sin. Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Chapter 5 of John. John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. After what Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. You see that? If you claim you have been forgiven, you should have had also the instruction of the law, the commandment of the Lord. Now that you have been forgiven, and you have been made whole, sin no more, lest it was sin come on thee. But told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 34, I wait to righteousness and sin not. That's the evidence you have actually got the grace of God and you have come for forgiveness in the sight of the Lord. I wait to righteousness and sin not. 1 John chapter 1. In first John chapter 1 from verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say 
We have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light and sins in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin. Chapter 3 of 1 John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. That's the evidence you really have forgiveness. You don't continue in the sins that have been forgiven. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. The seven little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous, he that committeth sin is of the devil. And the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, tell me the rest, does not commit sin. When you are forgiven, you are born again. You have a new life. You have a new nature. And that forgiveness will lead you to fellowship as well as freedom. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Chapter 5, verse 18. First John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sins not. We know. And that was common knowledge to real believers, true believers. That ought to be common knowledge today to real believers. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. So then we understand, we preach, we pray, we ask for forgiveness, and then when that forgiveness comes, it comes with the power to live the victorious life. We we'll come to point number two. The promise and the privilege of forgiveness with from God. The promise and the privilege of forgiveness from God. Matthew chapter 6, looking at verse 12. Matthew 6, verse 12, he says, And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors forgive us our debts is there any promise we can claim to be able to pray that prayer from the depth of our heart with great expectation confidence in god that you will answer yes is giving us promise and you will find the promise in different parts of the bible let's look at isaiah chapter 55 isaiah the five, we're looking at the six and the seven. Seek ye the Lord, while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. That's the condition of the forgiveness. What? Well, there is condition, a condition of forgiveness. Number two, there, there is the cost of forgiveness. Number three, there is the consequence of forgiveness. Number one is the condition. What are the things you do? What's the attitude you have? In what way do you make yourself appear before the Lord? The condition. Then number two, the cost. Of that forgiveness, can just can God just forgive you like that? No. What's the cost? Calvary. What's the cost? The cross. What's the cost? The death of Jesus. What's the cost? The blood of Jesus. 
Jesus giving himself, offering himself as a sacrifice to die for you on the cross of Calvary. That's the cause, the consequence. All our forgiveness, no condemnation anymore, consequence. No desire to continue sinning anymore, the consequence. Peace with God and purity in your heart, that's the consequence. Now, look at that again. It tells us in this chapter 55, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. You need to do something. You cannot just stay back and just relax and say, if he wants to forgive me, he'll forgive me. Let the wicked forsake his way. And then it says, and the righteous is thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and toward God, for he will abundantly pardon. He will pardon. Give me good amen. amen. Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 28, Proverbs chapter 28, we're looking at verse 13. He that covereth the sin shall not prosper. He who just comes to the Bible study and he hears all this, and the Spirit of God is reminding him, you messed up your life. You owe, you owe a great debt. You are disobedient to the Lord. You are not paying back to the Lord the obedience that He deserves. You are a debtor. You ought to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those that trespass against us. If He refuses to do that, He covers up His sin by religious activities. Preacher. Keep on preaching and a sin healing in the heart. Walker, keep on walking and a sin and guilt, condemnation in the heart. And then counselor, you keep on counseling and the counseling you are giving to other people. You yourself, you don't have the grace to carry on that uh, to be able to carry out that kind of counseling. Yes, you need to make restitution because the word of God says, I about you. It's so easy to counsel. You know the truth. Are you living by the truth? And then you cover it up and wrap it up. He that covers his sin shall not prosper. But who confesses and forsaken them? That's the condition. That's the condition. The condition of forgiveness. He that he says, he that confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. I pray God will help us to understand it. I will have the mercy of God in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 1. The condition, the cause, the consequence of forgiveness. It says in verse, chapter 1 verse 16, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. You see the condition there? You must make up your mind if you know that the sin is evil and you are warning other people. Why would you warn them if you didn't know that the sin was dangerous, deadly, damnable? You are warning them because you know of the damnation, the doom of sinners. Then carry forth the one in yourself and wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your being from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Make it round about time. And seek judgment. Read the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. After you've cleaned up what you can clean up, you confess what you can confess, then come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That's the consequence, white as snow, white as snow. And then it says, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's the consequence of that forgiveness, a change comes. I pray that change will come to everyone. Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. We're looking at verse 3. 
In Jeremiah chapter 36 verse 3, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all these evil which I propose to do unto them, that's the judgment that will come upon them, that they may turn every man from his evil way. That's the condition of forgiveness. But forgiveness is not just automatic. And it's saying that they shall return every man from a civil way that I may forgive if they return, that's the condition, then I will forgive that I may forgive the iniquity and the sin. Second Chronicles chapter 7. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, we're looking at verse 14. Second Chronicles. Chapter 7, reading from verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, if they all take pride in we are the children of God, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if they will not minimize the authority of the world, if they will not dilute the strength of the world, if they will not weaken the impact of the world by useless testimonies, saying, after all, we are the people of God, we are called by His name. And those testimonies that do not hold any weight, any value, that's why it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, Turn from their wicked ways, that's the condition of forgiveness, and turn from their wicked ways. We cannot just come before God and say, forgive us our sins, forgive us our, our debts, as we forgive our debtors. We have to turn, we have to repent. I want to tell the Lord, we feel deeply sorry. For the evil sin that has been done, it says that they turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I believe God will do that. I said God will do that. But you know, if we who call ourselves people of God, do surprise themselves that they know God, if they live in the sea, and then the word of God, like a mighty trumpet, is sounding the alarm unto them, saying, Turn, turn, O ye house of Israel, for why will ye die? My people who are called by my name to humble themselves and to seek my face and to pray and to turn from their wicked ways if you hear that sound of the alarm and you, re and you refuse to turn the Ninevites will come against you in judgment on the final day and the Ninevites will say I didn't hear, we didn't hear regular preaching systematic preaching Structured preaching. We didn't go through many verses of the Bible, but somebody came to our city and he didn't even tell us about the possibility of forgiveness. All he announced is, and yet 40 days, and he never shall be overthrown. We repented and we got forgiveness. Then the neighbors will judge you on the final day. How could you have been there at the Bible study? And you learned for more than one hour. And that wasn't the only message you have had. You have had it over and over and over. If you could harden yourself in sin, God will not be able to accept you into heaven. The Ninevites will accuse God of injustice. The Sodomites will accuse God of injustice. And all the people of the world that you need to have the opportunity that you have and yet just one word and just one message they turn with crying and tears away from their sin if you refuse to turn and you do not take the prayer of Jesus to heart forgive us our death as we forgive our debtors and you continue in sin if you die in that condition 
the Ninevites will rise up on that final day. Look with me at Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. As I once sent this message, it's a message without explanation. It's a message without introduction, point one, point two, and point three. All Jonah said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he, he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and pronounced and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and, the, and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast have no flock taste anything, let them not feed. And then it says in that verse, you should not even eat, let them not feed, nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. And yea, let them turn every one from his evil way. That's a condition of forgiveness. Let them turn. Let them turn. That's repentance. Let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence in their hands. Who can tell? If God will turn and repent, they were not even sure of forgiveness because Jonah did not assure them there was any promise or privilege of forgiveness. But they still repented all the same. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their words that they turned from their evil ways, that they turned, that they turned from the evil way to fulfill the condition. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. He forgave them. For those who repent today, God will forgive in Jesus' name. I come to point number three. The possibility and the peril of profiting forgiveness from God. The possibility of forfeiting and losing that forgiveness. The possibility and the peril, the danger of losing that forgiveness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And now in verse 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It's personal now. It's personal now. If you as a person forgive those who trespass against you, you have received the forgiveness of the Lord. Then you become tender. You become merciful. You become compassionate. And then you are pity on those who have offended you. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father too will forgive you. Then it says in verse 15, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, if you are hard-hearted, you claim that God has forgiven you, but you are hard-hearted, you are cruel, you are wicked, you are bloodthirsty, you enjoy oppressing those who have offended you, and you sought forgiveness from the Lord. In verse 15, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father which is in heaven, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. But I need to explain to you, this is talking about personal affairs. 
And you know, and the, the, the sin against God, and that's, the, that's the mistake the priests make in their churches. Now, those sins were not sin against the priest, it's a sin against God. And then they say, I forgive you, you don't have any right to do that. That sin has not offended you, has offended God. Only God can forgive sins committed against Him. And then there's sin against humanity, not sin against you in particular. And a police officer might see you outside and you do something wrong. And he happens to be a Christian. And God has forgiven him. And now he goes and he sees a criminal outside. That criminal has not offended the policeman. And then the policeman catches him. And then somebody says, but didn't you study the Bible? If you forgive others, God will forgive you. No, that's not a personal offense. And the man has committed a crime against humanity. And therefore the policeman will prosecute him. And then they will charge him. And they will bear the punishment. How could he do that and not forgive everybody on the street? Well, have anarchy. That's not what God is teaching us. He's teaching us that if there is a sin committed against you personally, you forgive. If it's committed against humanity, we have to deal with that. A church happens to be a Christian. And he brought all these cases to the court. And he knows what the law says. And if you just say, all right, go back and just do whatever you like, if that is how to run society, there will be no peace, there will be no orderliness, everybody will just do whatever they want to do. No, the Bible says that he lifts not up the sword in vain. It's going to judge, it's a judge. That man in the court has not committed personal offense to that judge. It's a sin against humanity. You have a school. There are rules and regulations in that school. If a child in that school tries to corrupt other children in that school, and then you have to, you have to be the proprietor or the principal, and then you suspend that child, and the mother brings that child back to your office the second day and says, uh, How can you do this? Forgive my daughter now. And were you not at the Bible study yesterday? There should be no discipline in the school. Just forgive every one of them. You tell that mother, you tell that papa that this your child did not offend me personally. It's an offense against policy, against the law in the school. You know many people don't understand, and they just say there's a blanket forgiveness for everybody. Now everybody can run rampant and just do whatever they like. No. Why didn't Jesus just give that kind of blanket forgiveness to all the Pharisees and to all the Sadducees and to Judas Iscariot and to the people that did not repent, just give them blanket forgiveness? No. When somebody offends in a personal way, husband and wife at home, you offend one another, forgive. That's what Jesus was saying. Parents and children, a personal offense, you forgive. But if it's not a personal offense, sin against the truth. Sin against the doctrines of the Bible. That's not an offense against me. It's an offense against God. If your work has done something wrong, maybe a speech false doctrine wants you to mislead other people. And then the Bible says that such people, their mouths should be shut. So they don't keep on deceiving other people. And there is, how could the pastor do that and stop that person from preaching? Isn't he telling us that Jesus said that you must forgive? Yes, forgive those who offend you. They offend me personally, personally. But if they offend the church, if they offend Christ, if they offend the preaching false doctrine, that's not offense against me. We have to deal with that. We must understand the Bible. That's what the Bible says. Study to show yourself approval to God. 
A rock man that needs not to be ashamed of the truth, not to be ashamed, dividing, rightly dividing the world of truth. Now, personal offense. And when people offend you personally, you must forgive. If God has forgiven you, you must forgive. Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, we're looking at it from verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how ought shall my brother sin against me? It's not sin against God, against me. It's not sin against the Holy Spirit, against me. It's not sin against humanity, against me. It's not sin against the church, against me. How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus says unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. But always remember this sin, personal sin against another person. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which will take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not so paid, it is not commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and used him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pairs. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, and said, Pay me. Remember once again, as personal offense. Me. Not sin against humanity. That's why you cannot deal with that. Not sin against the kingdom. That's why you cannot deal with that. Not sin against the church. The sin against the church. That for you as an individual, you cannot deal with that. This is personal sin and offense against you in particular. And the man said, Pay me that thou owest. And his, and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. And he would not, but wait and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, sorrowful, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, that I had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgive thee all that debt, because thou deserves me. Shouldest thou not also have that compassion of thy fellow servant, even as I have pity on thee? And his Lord was lost, and delivered into the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. He forfeited the forgiveness given unto him. Don't worry about your theology. Maybe some, uh, some people there, listening to me, you've gone to seminary. And in seminary they told you that forgiveness is forever and ever. Those are theologians, don't, don't worry about them. This is Christ. This is the Lord. This is Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And he told this parable. And he said, if God has forgiven you, but you are holding grudge, malice, I mean, a vengeful spirit against those who have offended you personally. And you are tormenting them, torturing them, imprisoning them, limiting them, so that until they pay you what they owe you. Jesus said, if you do that, you forfeit your forgiveness. Don't let false teachers or prophets deceive you. Look at the conclusion of verse 35. 
so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart, not from your lips, not just shallow words, empty words, insincere words, superficial language, if ye from your heart, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. And you know that Jesus said this repeatedly, Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, we're reading from verse 25 and verse 26. I want you to stand praying for thee. If you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, if ye do not forgive those personal, personal offenses, then it says, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, we're looking at verse 36. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, that ye be not judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4 is telling us, Once you have been forgiven by God, you have tenderness in your heart, gentleness in your life, compassion coming from your soul unto people. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you as all malice. And now be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That's what the request requires from us. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, here is the commandment of the Lord. You have received the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, the salvation of the Lord. Show that same mercy, that same love unto others. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man has a quarrel against any. Remember please, remember please, this is personal offense, a quarrel against any. And this is not church administration. It's not talking about people preaching false doctrine. You know, and there are people that just twist the word of God. And they say, just forgive everybody. Don't stop anyone. Don't discipline anyone. Let them preach whatever false doctrine they want to preach. Manifest on holy, unrighteous, and sanctified, and godly attitude. Don't just leave them in the ministry. Don't, don't touch them. After all, Jesus said, forgive. You twist the Bible. You twist the Bible. But you know, if you're going to interpret a right, when there's a personal offense, a quarrel against any, then you forgive. And look at that again, Colossians, I'm reading Colossians chapter 3. In that Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, for bearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgive you, so also do ye. I pray the Lord will help us. We we'll come back to Matthew now, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, here is a prayer the Lord has taught us to pray. Forgive us our debts. That's the plea, that's the prayer. And that prayer is based on the promise of God. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man is false. And let him return unto the Lord. And then it says, The Lord will forgive and abundantly pardon. If my people are called by my name, 
will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways. God says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. That's why we can pray. Forgive us our debts. Now, as we forgive, as we forgive those who personally sin or trespass against us, as he forgives us, we're so happy and joyful that he has forgiven us, and then we're willing to stretch out the hand of love, of mercy, of fellowship to other people. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord from our heart. A serious matter now. Forgiveness of God. The mercy of God. That he wants to give us a great, great, great blessing. The blessing of forgiveness. Talk to the Lord. Check up your life. Forgiveness is such a blessed, blessed, blessed heritage we have from the Lord. And it's based on the promise, the promise the Lord has given us. Your eternity depends on this. Your peace with God, reconciliation with God depends on that forgiveness. I want to ask the Lord to forgive you. You remember this in your tongue, you're hiding. It will not help your eternity to hide it. Come into the presence of the Lord, hearing the word of God should turn us around, change us, transform us. We have guilt in your heart, condemnation in your heart, a burden because of sin unconfessed, and sin unforsaken, and sin unforgiven. But you know, Christ paid a great price for your forgiveness, He shed His blood for your forgiveness. He died on the cross of Calvary for your forgiveness. I can call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I accept the sacrifice. You became my substitute. You became my sin bearer. And you have become my savior. Very important, very important, very important. It's the most, the most blessed act of the Almighty God. The most costly of all the acts of the Almighty God. To grant you forgiveness on the basis of the death, substitutionary death, vicarious death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary for you. That's why you can come with confidence and pray, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And if you call yourself, a minister in the gospel, a preacher, a pastor, an apostle, a bishop, an overseer, and you have the burden of secret sin. Preaching is useless, it's worthless, but you're holding on to that sin. You're condemned. But you come to the Lord, like David came to the Lord. Have mercy upon me. Forget your position, forget your title, forget your privilege, forget your certificate of seminary, forget everything. And say, Lord, I need your mercy. Forget how important you think you are in the kingdom. You need forgiveness. Only when you have that forgiveness, that peace of mind, and you know, you know, the comforting word of the Spirit, when you witness with your heart that when I child of God, that's only then you say, Then will I teach transgressors thy way. And even then you walk gently, you walk subtly. Just came out of that experience, the Lord has just forgiven you. The tenderness will be there, the gentleness will be there, the appreciation of the forgiveness of God will be there. You'll be walking softly and gently. 
they were polite, they were patient with other people, they would manifest that love of forgiveness to other people. Tell him to forgive you. With forgiveness comes fellowship. If we walk in the light, or see us in the light, you cannot walk uprightly without forgiveness. The Lord of sin will not allow you to walk uprightly. But when the forgiveness has come, then if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And now freedom, freedom. The Son did not leave but you, where we is Christ, has made you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Neither do I condemn you, you are forgiven, but go and sin no more. Thou art made whole, sin no more, lest there was sin come on you. Away to righteousness and sin not. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. The seed of God remains a bind sin. He cannot sin because he's born of God. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? Live any longer therein. If the Lord has set you free, live in that freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from sin. Freedom from sin. Let your life show your forgiveness, your fellowship, your freedom.